another 8190 um, this is a bit of a daily driver for the owner it's not in the best uh, physical condition but it's not in the worst by any stretch uh, except this one's got some electrical faults so as well as doing the usual belt stuff that we've done on the previous ones I thought I'd do a video on this one because this is going to involve some soldering I think now I'm told uh, this has got a power issue it was working up until recently and it was in uh, regular use up until recently where it won't power on properly it's got some sort of power fault I'm told and also um, the record mute switch uh, has snapped at some point and an attempt has been made to glue it and all that really happened was the glue stuck to the felt and it didn't hold the join uh, at all now I've got another one uh, behind me which is in pretty bad shape overall which is a spare parts machine um, the record mute switch on that is fine so what I think we're going to do is swap the switches over but uh, as I say there's more to do on this one because it's apparently got a power fault so I've got it plugged in, AC power's on, now the heads are a bit mucky on it so I'm not going to put tape through it, I'm just going to see what the deal is. So The belts are alright on this, I mean they work, they're still going to get changed. Okay, that seems to work. Now that's interesting. Why is that so low? We're on AC power. That shouldn't be low, that's way down, down, down. That's status quo down. Um, so there's something up there. Okay, try the radio. Yeah, it's down even more. It's just faded away. Yeah, something's up there, isn't it? Look how weak that is to come on. Lost audio. Hmm, okay, so either we've got a supply or a demand issue. <laughs> um, either um, something's gone wrong in the circuit at the back by the transformer, so it's not supplying enough or there's something pulling the supply down so we'll have a look at this, I think we'll do some measurements and um, run it from the current limited bench supply as well we'll be able to tell from there if it's drawing more than it should be and we'll disconnect the power and meter the output from the transformer circuit separately, see what's going on I noticed when I turned it over that there was a rattle so something there that screw is also pretty loose. <coughs> As mentioned in the previous videos, don't rip the back off it when you open it because there's power connectors at this side you have to unplug and at the other side there are two antenna connectors. You've got to pull those off before you can separate the back. I found the rattle, it was a piece of what's probably the uh, front perspex on the dial. Okay, just a couple of observations compared to the last 8190 that I opened. Um, the board, there's a screw there and a screw there. I'm sure those screws were missing in the last one I opened because when I opened it this board was flopping around and there's also black tape which looks very old I wonder if that's factory um, yeah the adhesive's completely gone on it but the first two that I opened didn't have that tape so I wonder if that is factory and that's, that's no good but that would kind of make sense that some of this would be held in place a bit neater than the last couple I opened so maybe yeah they are supposed to be taped in this looks much better it's a bit weird that that's been squashed over um, that little couplet there there's a little bit of dust in it but it's actually it's 
actually not too bad this one, it's actually quite clean by comparison but um, yeah just that was interesting that they were taped over and the screws are present because they were definitely missing in the last one weird okay I have the back off and I have the power supply connected and I'm just going to bring this up and just look at the current drawer and see what we have right at the crossing point where it powers on so it's 7.2 volts 9 volts And still showing it's down a bit on the meter. So I think now I'll measure the back. Uh, I'll measure the back uh, power supply in the other half of it. See what's going on because yeah, looking at the circuit, the voltage regulation is done by a Zener diode that's at the base of a power transistor, and we should be able to measure 13.5 volts. At the uh, the base of that uh, zen at the base of that transistor, which comes off the Zener diode, and if I put the power on at 13.5 volts, it's a little bit low. I've actually tried it earlier, and it was lower still, but it's like it's slowly coming up. So this could be something really simple. I think there's a bit of resistance somewhere. Um, it could be something really simple, like a little bit of muck in the switch. So I'm going to clean out the function switch. I've just knocked that. <laughs> I'm going to clean out the function switch and uh, just see if that does anything. Mm, that has sort of slowly come up as I've been trying it. It was about 11 volts earlier. There's still some kind of resistance I think across the um, possibility of a capacitor that's going IESR. Um, they are kind of right in the firing line of the um, heat sink under here. Unfortunately this heat sink makes them really difficult to uh, be able to get to but we'll keep looking at it see where we get. Now even after cleaning we've definitely got some issues because I'm getting really erratic voltages now. Uh, we're down to sort of 10 volts and if I wiggle something like the band switch you can see it's kind of still kind of erratic so we've definitely got something wrong across that power supply. After cleaning um, the band switch, the function switch and the little micro switch on the top here and then leaving this a while, um, I'm now getting much more consistent voltages. That's when I switch it to aux mode or phono input. When I switch it back to radio, when I switch it to tape um, the voltage will drop off unless the motor switch is closed. But it's much more consistently coming back to around 13.31, 13.32. I was getting 8 volts, 9 volts, 11 volts. It was different every time I moved the switch. And I always find in switches with this um, deoxid stuff, one, try not to get it everywhere, and two, when you sprayed it and wiggled the switch a bit, leave it a while. Um, it seems to soak in over a period of time, make its way to the contacts, because without dismantling the switch completely you can't always totally get to them, especially in case of a micro switch. But I'm getting way more consistent voltages. So I, I also notice as well when I meet it across the contacts of this micro switch, uh, we have a 13.5 input from the power supply. And at the um, output side I was seeing 12.5 at times, so somewhere I was losing a volt across the switch. So I do wonder if there had been some resistance in the contacts in this switch. This is coming off the Zener diode again, which is at the base of that power transistor. But it seemed like the whole voltage coming in through this micro switch 
was all over the place. And now it seems really consistent. I, th I think it's going to be one of those things that I have to leave it for a while and then come back to it when it's cold and just see that it works exactly the same. It works flawlessly without being on for a while. And then I can leave it on for a while and it, it's okay. You can hear the hiss of the radio because I've reconnected the speakers, just detuned. But the whole the voltage was dropping enough that the amp was dropping down and then the, the radio was cutting off. So similar to what was happening with the band switch um, when we were running that before so um, that's still a little bit scratchy so we could also have a shoe in that band switch might give that another blast with the stuff but um, way more consistent now so it could have been something as boring as switches but with it being a temperamental fault I just have to leave it for a little while, keep coming back to it and make sure I get the same stable reading that I'm getting there. Did I say 13.5 or 13.8 volts at the Zena diode earlier on? I'm not sure, just look back at the uh, service manual again on the, in the diagram and it's 13.3 volts. So that is bang on correct. Um, it could also be, um, because I've obviously sprayed it with cleaner, the thing is laid on its face so the board is laid flat. So Again, when you spray the cleaner stuff in, the cleaner's got gravity to help it slowly weed through the, uh, the connectors and everything. And um, now the voltage has again seemed really stable, so um, that might have something to do with it, but it definitely seems like there was some resistance around this input. Um, nothing pulling it down at all. So we'll leave it, as I said, and see how it was, but that is actually bang on correct. Real quick, because I haven't got a lot of time today, it's the next day, we're going to see if this gives us 13.3 volts on that Zena diode, I'm going to put the power on. So that's power supply at 13.5, I'm going to switch it to the radio. 13.3 volts, and that's definitely worked. Let's see what it's going to take then to get this switch out. So. As on all the other ones, there's a few things we need to disconnect and undo, a few cable retainers. And I've actually not taken off all the controls on the top, so I need to do that. So I've separated the main unit sub-chassis from the front panel and I'm going to have to take all these stems off. Well, these switch covers I should say from off the stems and see what's uh, what we've got here so when you pull these up try and pull them straight up some of them are a bit loose don't try and twist them because it's much more likely to break them now this is interesting that some of these look different Got little inserts in. Ah, okay, so there seems to be some sort of little rubber insert that's on some of them that's sticking in some of the uh, switch tops and coming out of others. Interesting, that's a bit different to the ones we had before. So I have to Try and figure out which of them will and won't fit on each one. Okay. And I think with this bit of cardboard shielding uh, underneath this uh, felt, and I think we have to remove the one on the loudness switch. And there we go, then we can peel that back. That's actually held on on a little heat stake piece of plastic on the end, so it's just going to have to flop over the side, but that's okay. And this piece of cardboard shielding, how are you fixed on? We have a brown ground wire down at the front, that's underneath the playback gain pots, and it's marked BRN for brown. 
that and then just glued it's glued to the tops um, that's a little bit awkward very carefully try and separate that some of it well I managed to very carefully get that um, cardboard off there there is a little bit that ripped but it's not the end of the world it is sort of just glued you can see where it's tacked on even on top of a capacitor apparently um, it's kind of sticky on the back or maybe it has some kind of adhesive maybe they sort of heat it up it's a little bit weird um, but there's nothing that won't repair and go back on there that's fine so it's just a just a shield basically um, so we've got to take three screws out I have a concern that um, this blue wire going to this bulb here it's going to be a bit of an issue because the bulb is of course glued in and the glue is pretty good on this one so I can't get that bulb out because I don't want to break the bulb that glue looks pretty well set on this one um, I, can pros I can possibly loosen them from the other side Go through those little teeth there. Just might be able to get just enough clearance just to be able to turn this board around because we need to be able to get the switch off. So let's take three screws out and see where that gets us. So the board is clipped in here. Yeah. I've also got a lot of wiring holding it in place. Uh, there's another wire retainer underneath. We can loosen that. It's just under here, there's a wire retainer there. We can loosen that. A bit more of that up, so there's another, yeah, there's another retainer hiding there. So, the trouble with this is there's a lot of tight wiring that's there's a couple of connectors there, I might be able to remove. Don't know that they'll make it any easier. Uh, Okay, excuse the unusual angle. In order to get around that bulb issue, I had to cut the wire for the bulb and I will uh, solder and heat shrink those back on. I can't get that bulb out really without breaking it because uh, it's really well glued in. It's better glued in than any of the others I took off. Be wary of these if you take this bulb off. Um, if you wrench on these, these are soldered to the bottom, you'll not see them until you get the board off. If you wrench it out, uh, you'll get these out. But it's really just there's loads of cables running along the uh, the inside edge of the board, and I had to kind of ease it forward over these plastic clips, um, over these bulb wires that I've had to cut in order to be able to get to the solder joints underneath because I need to take this switch out, and it's just awkwardly just stuff shot. So you can spin it around a bit. Uh, the switch we need to look at is here. So it looks like they've got. Four ground tabs holding it in, thankfully they're not massive, so we should be able to get them out. And I'm wary that uh, two of the uh, pins are bent over, and I bet they do that on all of them, don't they? Yeah, they do, probably just to secure it. Uh, that can make removing them really difficult, but we'll give it our best shot. Let's see if we can get in. The desoldering gun in and get this broken switch out. These ground planes are.
Careful, wiggle. Don't wrench it out, just wiggle it. There we go. There's a damage switch out and no damage or lifted pads. I love that hacko gun. I had a really cheap one. Well, I had two really cheap ones actually once upon a time. And let's just say buy ones, cry ones. What I should have done. Yes, that hacko was expensive in the UK, but it's really good. So, switches out. Here's a really dirty spares machine that uh, I've stolen the uh, switch from. Alright, so we've nicked this switch out of the donor unit. Now have to be careful to get it on the right way because the toggle's got to push that direction. Um, the screen print on the board is actually upside down so you have to be wary of that. Don't follow the screen print thinking you've got to pull it this way because uh, everything mounts that way. Um, so yeah that's been soldered in. I'm going to try and get this back in place, reconnect the uh, plugs, get the screws in and uh, then uh, see if that works and get the, oh, get the shielding back on as well. So let's see if we can finagle that. Um, coincidentally the spares machine, the bulb, the glue on the bulb was really weak uh, so I managed to just take the bulb straight out and move it but on this one it's it's just like super glue. Um, <laughs> it just didn't want to uh, come out at all and as I said I didn't want to risk breaking the bulbs it was easier just to cut the wire. Um, so yeah I did actually try coincidentally looking to see if I could find a replacement switch and I got as far as finding um, a company in Hong Kong that possibly makes a switch that may be suitable but um, with a couple of flaws one flaw being that they didn't answer my email um, and thinking about it a potential drawback might be that if they do answer they might want to sell me 25,000 of them but not one of them um, and there's um, Something else, which I'll try and explain in a bit more detail later on, but it's just something, I, a realisation I came to about the way in which these switches have actually been designed um, for this particular application and the way the angles work on the toggles. I'll try and come back to that, talk about that in a bit, but for now, let's just see if we can wrestle this back into place. So what's holding it up? Another thing I thought about with the glue on that bulb is I could have either used heat or um, alcohol potentially to uh, soften that glue but again there's something I'm wary of. One is that the tuning dial is in the way and if we um, compromise or just break the tuning dial, we've kind of had it, uh, the dial, dial cord I should say. And the other is that of course the actual dial face is, is on the back of this so again if I have alcohol or molten glue dripping down it then I'm going to ruin the dial face so it's just a bit too close for comfort really it's just way easier just to rejoin these wires there's just enough slack on them to be able to do that without fuss so let's reconnect these connectors here again I've gone off on this before about stuff designed in the 70s that uh, uses a couple of connectors as a token gesture <laughs> but it never puts a whole lot on a connector oh no we'll just solder the majority of the wires and we'll just put these couple on on a plug <laughs> you should wonder why what was the point right there pushed right in I'm going to try and sort of get the majority of this back in where it was and there are those two wire retainers we'll have to tidy the wires back into make sure they don't get trapped 
and the back goes back on. Lovely. So what I was saying about these switches, um, obviously the problem with this one is the little stem that sticks off the top on this plastic rocker part has snapped off. And if you notice the top of that rocker is parallel with the top of the switch. Now, although this is a two position switch, I'm doing my best to keep this in focus, although this is a two position switch, if you look at the data sheets for this style of switch and you look at the two position version, what you'll notice is that the um, angle of travel in, in each position is 60 degrees apart, kind of like this. And on a three position switch, you've got one like this, one straight up, and one like this to the right. So you've got 30 degrees of difference with one straight in the middle. In order to get a two position switch with a resting position in the middle, you effectively have to take a three position switch and modify it so that it can't move in one direction, but it can in the other. So to source a replacement for this switch, there's every chance that what I have to do is find a three position and use the rocker and the shell from the three position. And then a little bit like those pots I've been doing on the, the other boom box, you'd probably have to undo these little metal wings of the shell, pull the guts out of the switch and swap over the locking mechanism because this is actually a slide switch and a little um, rocker on top just moves a sliding mechanism. For all intents and purposes this is a slide switch. So you probably have to cobble a bit of a Frankenstein switch together with pieces of the broken one and the shell and the rocker from the uh, the toggle, you know, from uh, the old one. That would be all well and good if I could get one. Uh, as I say, I have seen them on this um, Hong Kong company's website. They do make them, but I don't know if they're currently available. They probably won't sell me one of them. So, unfortunately, for now, we've had to um, put the uh, take this from um, a scrap 8190. Uh, I'll take the new switch, should I say, um, in order to do it. But it, if a switch does turn up, we can always uh, replace that in the one that we've stolen it from. Um, but for now, yeah, unfortunately, one's had to uh, had to die more or less for uh, the other to live. Just something to note while I've um, got this apart at this stage. We noticed on the front that there's um, some cosmetic damage to the uh, clear perspex at the front where the tuner dial is. And I realise what that is, is some of the uh, clips that uh, you can see, one is complete there. Two of them are actually broken off. That's what it was. And there's a clip down here as well that has been um, snapped in half, I actually found a little bit that had broken off it, uh, rattling around in the case, as well as a little tiny black piece of plastic that must have been off the, um, the chassis. So, it's kind of a weird one that it's, there's also, oh, yeah there, there's a slight crack in the case as well, so, um, it's a strange one, it's as if um, someone's tried to remove the um, clear acrylic and I don't know why because it's it's really good condition to be honest these are prone to uh, fogging up the tape door is prone to the same thing the spares one that I've got you can actually see the text on it where it's had the sticker on the front um, and it's kind of hasn't faded behind the text but it has faded in the clear bit so um, the three that I've worked on so far have not had that problem but you can definitely see it in uh, the spares one and I've seen it on others on eBay etc um, and I've read on forums about people trying to take this um, perspex out 
uh, to try and polish it or clean it. I attempted to polish the front of the um, spares one and it doesn't make any difference to the fog, it's embedded in the plastic, it's not a surface thing. Um, but I think as well as the clips actually holding it in place to the plastic, I think ultimately it's also covered up by the aluminium trim on the front which is glued on. And as I spoke about this before, you can't really remove the aluminium trim like that easily without kind of bending it, levering it, damaging it, scratching it. Um, it's a possibility you could heat up the glue perhaps with maybe hot air, but again, you've got to be so careful that you don't uh, damage the paint or warp the plastic um, when you do that. Um, when they get to a, a certain age, again like the spares one, the, the glue starts to dry up and break down anyway, and sometimes they just half of it just comes off. Um, but yeah, this is this is weird how it's got these chips in it. It does, as I say, look like someone's tried to tried to get it out and make a mess of it because I can't think of a reason why it would naturally do that. Um, and there's some slight sort of kinks in the front of the aluminium. I think it's on this side. It's on one of the sides. So yeah, it does look like, it does look like someone's attempted to get it off, and I don't really know why. But it was just a, an observation I've made on this one. Otherwise, the condition of it. Is, is fairly reasonable. I'm going to do the belts on this one now um, because I've got all the parts I need. I have given this top felt a bit of a clean up just with a, a hoover and a brush um, and all these switches will get clean before it um, gets reassembled. But now I'm going to pull the transport out and do the belts. Um, I'm going to be fairly quick on this and fairly brief on what I cover in the video. If you want more of a breakdown of how to do the belts in an 8190 refer to my previous video I don't need to go over the same thing in full depth twice, so I'll keep it brief on this one. So of initial curiosity is that this screw here is loose. There are four transport screws and that one was halfway out. Weird. And this one here which has a cable retainer and on the 8290 model has a ground strap but this is the second one where there's a retainer but I haven't seen a ground strap on the 8190s so, and then there are a few points where there are wires caught on the uh, little retainer clips that's the easy one this is the tricky one it's right down inside under the counter and this one usually takes some long nose pliers hmm. so this is interesting I think there's an extra ground wire connected to the bottom board, I don't recall that one being there on the last one I worked on. Um, is that? I think it is. Uh, I don't know if it is a ground wire. Is it just one of the wires? Okay, I'm not sure what I did differently on the previous one but there's some wires that go to the leaf switch board at the bottom that are caught somewhere unless is there a retainer there you go I'm sure they weren't like that on the other model Okay, bit of a balancing act as it was before. I did manage to sort of adjust the root in that black wire, but this, I don't know why. It seems tighter on the this one than the last one I did. It may be worth if it makes it easier to actually um, remove this leaf switch board um, that that black wire is connected to, and I think some of these wires possibly as well, um, just to give you a bit more leverage, but I'm in. Now these, I wonder if these have been done because these belts actually feel okay. Um, 
I'm going to suggest that they're probably replacement. Oh, that one's not though. Look at the kink in that one. I don't know if you can see that, but as it's going round, I wonder if the flywheel belt's been done before then. But that hasn't because that's got a right. In fact, the other belt as well. So the two square section belts have got kinks in them. So they're done. Um, but the flat belt actually feels fine. I'm going to replace it. But um, thankfully on this one, yeah. So let me spin this round a little bit so I can give you a better shot of the uh, layout. So again I've covered this in more detail on the previous video but just for a quick recap. On the 8190 there are two belts that go around the motor pulley because there are two pulleys stacked. Flat belt goes on top on the widest bit. Next one down is this winding belt which is a small square section belt. It goes to the bottom section of the motor pulley and then this belt connects to a smaller pulley underneath this one goes around the black one so that's the lowest down so both of them will come straight out but the flat belt for the capstan you have to remove uh, one screw in the side and then there's a screw underneath here you loosen you don't have to completely remove it and it allows you just to pivot the bracket enough to open this gap up and get the flat belts in and out now I've actually removed that yeah, it's probably a little bit dry, if anything. Uh, definitely not melting like the others, but yeah, I think it's ready for replacing. Uh, so yeah, we're going to do the lot. All right, all new belts are fitted. I forgot to get a shot of the back, but I mean, it looks exactly the same, of course. Um, but just to make a note of something, uh, whenever you change belts on something, uh, clean it, for God's sake, clean it. You'd think that, um, judging by the apparent state of those belts, you know, they weren't gooey, they were just a little bit dry. You'd think, well, not that much muck can come off them. I use um, isopropyl alcohol on all plastic parts, and I use acetone on um, any steel or brass parts, or aluminium, I guess. Um, be very careful with acetone around plastics, as always. But, you know, look at the, uh, look at the grime that came off there. I think that was mostly off the... Uh, the uh, flywheel, capstan flywheel, and um, yeah, um, give it a good clean and be careful not to get any twists in your belts. Try and get your twists out. Just to point out about belt condition, you see the kinks in those. Well, there's more kinks there than Ray Davis. Um, they're keeping that shape, so they are really dried out. Um, they still worked, but they were definitely ready for changing. So it's not as easy to tell when they're in situ that they are really ready for it but they were definitely ready for it uh, these have been supplied by deck tech again not a sponsor uh, but i've uh, been back and forth with these guys uh, on ebay to um, size up this full kit we've got a full kit of five for the 8190 these are now available on their site uh, you can see why it's definitely worth doing all five and not just two or three like some kits for some reason seem to have um, but every uh, belt that they've supplied has been really good quality uh, spot on fit and uh, very happy with that so so uh, now it's time to be uh, mindful of where wiring routing goes oh I've just spotted something right down here the reason that screw was loose is because that uh, standoff there what the screw goes that pillar is cracked so I'll put that back in but it might be not sure it might be worth me putting shame the rest of the plastics not around to my knowledge might be worth me putting a little spot of uh, glue or something over the top of the screw just like a thread locker just to hold that in place but yeah it looks like that's cracked so be very careful of your wiring routing this is why i like videoing things because i can refer back and uh, make sure that you put everything back inside wire clips where possible uh, don't forget to reattach any ground ties or in the case of this one the wire retainer 
and we can bolt this back in and then get cleaning the, uh, the heads and the uh, capstan and pinch roller. Oh, so that was a bit of an ordeal. Um, I actually forgot to put the bracket screw back in for the um, capstan flywheel. Um, that took several attempts to try and get it back in without it falling off and <laughs> falling into the unit. And then this um, cracked post, what I actually ended up doing, I'll have to put a photo in here because of the angle I can't film it, but I, I've got some um, heat shrink that's got uh, adhesive in the middle. It's uh, the kind of thing you can use to uh, secure plugs and things like that with. Um, it's quite common uh, for use on repairing um, Apple iPhone charger leads. Makes them a bit stiffer. Um, I cut a little piece of that and heat shrunk it round, and actually the heat was enough just to melt the plastic a little bit as well. And then, because it was slightly deformed, I had to find a, a pointed uh, screw, and this one's got a flange on it as well, to use instead of the um, the old self tapper that had a flat point on it or flat bottom on it, no point. Um, just to try and hold it in. It's it's I wouldn't call it like you know a weight a load bearing uh, fixing. But with everything else, the screw won't go anywhere. It will hold it in place at least. Um, it's the best repair I can really do uh, to that. So it's not super graceful, but um, it's going to work. Everything else will hold it in place, so it won't be going anywhere. But it's better than the screw just flapping around. I did actually find all the pieces of the, uh, the cracked post and was able to sort of secure it. Uh, with the heat shrink just to hold it around the outside. So that's that. So the transport's back in place. The wiring uh, should be routed right. We'll do some double checks on that. Um, but yeah, next thing I want to do is uh, do the clean up on the uh, heads and the pinch roller and everything and the capstan. Um, and then we can put it back together and test it. Um, actually, before I put the chassis in completely, I will need to do a speed test. So I'll need to test it um, before I bolt the chassis back into the front because you can only get to the um, speed pot on the motor from this angle which is really frustrating, I wish there was a little hole or something uh, so you could get to this while it was in the front of the machine but you can't, so can't remember if I mentioned this earlier I um, ran out of cotton buds and just went to generally pick some up and when I opened the box and got them home I found it with this weird shape and I noticed it mentions on the box sort of safety buds and I'm wondering if it's to stop um, especially with kids and babies, stop them sort of jamming you right in your ear. Um, but they're actually perfect for cleaning things like pulleys because you can really kind of jam this end into uh, the, the V shape, if you like, of the pulley. And this sort of fatter end on it um, seems to soak up more liquid. So if you've got them, you know, soaked in alcohol, um, it just seems to really get in there better. I quite like these. I'll have to look out for these again. They also don't seem quite as, the, the cotton on them is a bit more dense. They don't seem quite as fluffy and linty as other ones before that I've generally bought, you know. So, uh, and these little green ones, these have got a kind of, they've got a kind of cloth on the end in a way. They're kind of lint-free cleaner and they're flat. They're really good for getting into, um, right into a kind of pointed crevice as well because they're, they're so flat. The problem with them is um, I have to get them on eBay, they're actually quite expensive. Um, I think this might be my last one. Um, but yeah, they're, they're quite expensive to get uh, in, a, in a big bundle. I've gone through a lot of these doing things like PCB cleanup and whatnot, flux cleanup, or when I've been doing repairs to damaged tracks and stuff. But yeah, these are interesting, they're quite, they're quite useful. Let's get these heads done then. Yeah, they're quite a useful shape for really getting in there, I like these. A little bit of stuff coming off that. I think it will want to polish again, like the others have had. There's a bit of a hard deposit there, so I've actually got a little bit of acetone. Um, don't get this on the plastics. It doesn't run as much as alcohol, so it shouldn't go down the shaft, but don't get this on the pinch roller. I know we're very close there, but I don't want solid deposits. I want to quickly show something for an issue I'm having. These are the two spring mechanisms out of the door. And uh, if you notice this one, which is out of the one I'm repairing, doesn't have a collar on the gear. This one, which is out of the spares machine, does. 
And this one's having a problem where the spring is bending and this one I don't think will do it because that collar's in the way. I reckon the one I'm fixing is an earlier revision and the one I'm getting spares from, which I'm going to try this um, spring mechanism in uh, or rather which I've got this spring mechanism from should I say I do think it's a bit later um, but yeah it's having a problem where the um, the door clip on the side is is pushing it off and uh, it's making the front of the, the door come off so I'm going to try putting this one in and see if it behaves itself much better it's not sliding off the gear anymore so that little collar must have been a later model revision and it really helps because it was just pushing this plastic piece off the gear and the door was coming off so the springs must be prone to bending this way without that little collar in place Another one down. Um, the alignment was fine, the speed was spot on. There's so much factory sealant over the alignment screw that I would have had a job picking it off to adjust the alignment anyway, but it's fine. This is the tape that was recorded on the first one that I did up, the 8290. Dolby tracking, everything's fine. Sounds really great. Um, so yeah, I just got straight to cleaning up the back uh, inside and uh, screwing it back on, all the controls and everything have been cleaned uh, I've gone through and tested everything and it's, it's spot on so uh, if you want a more in-depth um, look at these definitely go back to the previous 8190 video I just wanted to cover the main faults on this that were different to the others and make a slightly shorter video uh, don't know if that really came out but there you go but yeah one more down